I will call the remote hearing of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee to today is April 6, 2021. This meeting is held in accordance with Rule 10.01, which was passed and allows for remote hearings. All remote hearings are recorded and live streamed by House The clerk will take the attendance by roll. Chair Hansen is present. Waslowick, Amy. Waslowick, present. Heitzman. Heitzman, present. Akum. Akum, present. Ackland. Ackland, present. Backer. Backer, present. Becker Finn. Becker Finn. Becker. Eklund. Eklund Becker present. present. Uh, Fisher. Fisher present. Green. Green present. I go. I go present. Jordan. Jordan present. Keeler. Keeler. Lee. Lee present. Lippert. Lippert present. Lewick. Lewick present. Morrison. Morrison present. Nelson. Nelson present. Uh, Tice. Tice. One more chance for Keeler. Let's see that she's in the waiting room. A quorum is present. A quorum is present. The next item on the agenda are the minutes for Thursday, March 25th, 2021. Representative Fisher, have you reviewed the minutes? Yes, Mr. Chair, I've reviewed the minutes from March 25th, 2021, and I would move their approval. Representative Fisher moves the minutes from March 25th, 2021. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Minutes are approved. Uh, members, today we're going to do a walkthrough of the Delete All Amendment to House File 1076, the Environment and Natural Resources uh, Omnibus Bill. So I'm going to turn the gavel over to uh, Vice Chair Waslawick, and I will uh, present the DE Amendment. Okay, thank you, Chair Hansen, and um, please... Uh, present the DE2 amendment to House File 1076, and I will I will move that um, House File 1076 be re recommended be recommended to be re referred to the committee on Ways and Means, um, and then we'll move that DE2 amendment in front of us so we can discuss it. Okay, um, members, this uh, DE2 amendment is a compilation of the bills that we have heard in this committee, and we have heard a lot of bills. Uh, and some have moved out of the committee and continued the work on and have come back. Uh, so I'm gonna have uh, Ms. Taylor, and Mr. Hagemeyer walk through the DE2. Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Mr. Um, Hagemeyer, go ahead. I'll start with the spreadsheet you'll see posted to the committee website and I can share it on the screen and attempt that as well here. Hopefully you can see the tracking sheet now. This would be the Article 1 spreadsheet. It'd be the Environment and Natural Resources Finance. And when you open it up, it should be timestamp 938 in the bottom corner. Uh, looking at the spreadsheet, I'll reference line numbers. That'd be the left-hand column here. Next to that, you'll see the agency and then the various change items. There's the fund source here, so like general fund, environmental fund, the type of funding, if it's a direct appropriation, a transfer, statutory, open. And then these columns here would be governor changes. So fiscal year 21, 22, and 23, which would be the upcoming biennium. And then the tails biennium of 24, 25. Starting here on over is the house change items. So the DE2 that you have in front of you with fiscal year 21, FY 22 and 23 biennium right here. And then this would be the tails biennium here. Uh, starting with the pollution control agency, you'll see the base funding level here. And then the change items start on line three. The governor had recommended a climate adapt adaptation and resiliency program of 2.9 million per biennium. The house starts it off at 250,000 the first year, 500 the second year, and then a million each year thereafter. Mr. Line Mr. Hagemeyer, sorry for interrupting. Is there any way that you could maybe zoom in a little bit or expand that? It's really, really difficult to see the font. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if that's possible, I'm also not sure. Also, question if it was okay. Sorry, what was that, Representative Heinzman? Madam Chair, I also had a question if it was okay. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, 
I was just hoping that maybe uh, Mr. Hagemeyer and, and Ms. Taylor could, as they're uh, walking us through, please identify changes from uh, what we may have heard in committee versus what we have here in the bill. All right, Mr. Hagemeyer, that, that looks a little bit better. And I, if you heard that um, question from that comment from Representative Heinzman, you can do that. While I can walking. attempt to. I don't know if you, if Representative Heinzman is looking for language changes or just the funding changes from the bill levels that we saw. Uh, Madam Chair. Representative Heinzman. Thank you. Um, at just wherever there's a departure from the bill as we heard it in committee, whether it be language or whether it be finance, be nice to know where those might be things that we didn't hear in committee that are now here in the bill uh, for today's meeting of the committee. So Mr. Hagemeyer, um, for, for you and Ms. Taylor, the best you can do and then if there's other things in the just the policy piece that got changed, I think Representative Hansen can probably cover some of those things as well in the later on. Uh, Madam Chair, I will attempt to do that. Some of the, I'll at least hit on the fiscal aspects that I can remember in my head. And then I know Ms. Taylor will go through some more of the language as we go through the bill. Um, as I mentioned for the first one, it was the governor's bill we had heard had 2.9 million per biennium. The house has 750, the first biennium, and 2 million in the second biennium. Line four was the governor's operating adjustment from the general fund. The house carried the same as the governor's bill. On line five, you'll see legal costs. Uh, the governor had a recommendation of $4 million to the DNR, of which $2 million can be transferred to the Pollution Control Agency. The House has $2 million to DNR and $1 million to transfer to Pollution Control Agency. On line six, you'll see the biofuels policy implementation. The governor had recommended $1.6 million starting in the tails. The House does not include that. On line seven, you'll see rulemaking requirements of 182,000 for the first two years. Uh, that's related to air permit fees and how they're charged. And you'll see language later in the bill about uh, related to those rulemaking requirements. On line eight, there's 500,000 per year for the first two years for the cumulative impacts impl implementation. Uh, that is a bill we heard previously, and this was funding level to get that started. Line nine is a transfer to MELCAT starting in the tails of 1.125 million uh, per year. The bill that you had heard previously was just a one-time transfer of 13,905, I believe. So total general fund change items are 2.266 million in the current biennium and then 4.4 million in the tails. Starting down on line 14, you'll see the non-general fund change items. The first three, line 14, 15, and 16, are related to per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. Some governor's change items for water monitoring, inventory pilot, and a source evaluation. The House is carrying all those change items. Uh, the first one being for 400,000, the first biennium, then 700,000 and 500,000. Line 17 was a governor's recommendation for new equipment for inclined for compliance and enforcement of $180,000 and $4,000 per year thereafter. The House is carrying that language and appropriation. Uh, line 19 was the governor's recommendation for the St. Louis River Mercury TMDL of $350,000 one time. The House has included that language and the appropriation. Uh, line 20 would be accelerated online services. The governor had recommended 300,000 per year from the environmental fund for this purpose. The house does not include that in the bill. Line 21 is the air appropriation increase from the environmental fund. Uh, the house is carrying the same language as the governor on this. Line 22 is an environmental fund transfer to the remediation fund. It's an increase. The base is currently 44 million for the biennium. The governor recommended an additional 4 million. The house has that at $3 million. Uh, line 23, you'll see a water program appropriation increase from the environmental fund. It's about $3 million per biennium. The house included that language and the appropriation. Line 24 and 25 is PFAS and food packaging use regulated. Uh, it's $104,000 the first year, 204 the second year, and then some of that 66,000 can be transferred to the Department of Health and it's ongoing. That I believe is the same language as was heard in committee. Line 26 is water quality standards, It'd be $492,000 from the environmental fund for the first biennium. Uh, that's a bill that's been heard a few times since last year, I believe. Line. 
uh, line, sorry, 27 would be a carpet product stewardship report requirements. It's $100,000 uh, for reporting requirement that you'll see later in the bill. This has changed from the carpet bill that you previously heard in committee. And you'll see the language later in the bill. Line 28 is a community liaison for air permitting, similar to like the municipal liaison economists at the, at the PCA. This appropriates $250,000 per year from the environmental fund for this purpose. Line 29 is uh, non-expiring air permit requirements. Uh, it's $250,000 the first two years from the environmental fund for this. And line 30 would be public hearing requirements for alleged violations, and that would be $48,000 uh, per year from the environmental fund. That would be, I believe the bill you had previously heard was $198,000. This was less because the amendment that was adopted reduced that amount. In total, there's almost $12 million of new appropriations to the, from the environmental fund in the current biennium. Starting on line 33, you'll see the remediation fund changes. Uh, line 33, 34, 35, and 36 are two programs where the agency was changing some of their statutory appropriation for the work to back to a direct appropriation for the administration of those programs in order to get more work through the door. And the House is carrying the language and appropriations for those. Line 37 and 38, it looks like a large change item. This would be the Petra Fund sunset date repeal. A large amount of work through the remediation fund is from a transfer from the Petro Fund. Uh, that was set to expire at the end of next year and next fiscal year. The language is in a different bill, but we included here as well to repeal that sunset so that they would be able to continue at the same level they've been doing for the current years. And then line 39, you'll see that same transfer from the environmental fund to the remediation fund of $3 million. Line 42 is the Landfill Responsibility Act. That was a governor's recommendation. The House included that bill as the governor recommended, and this is the special revenue fund revenue related to that program and expenditure. Line 44, you'll see the use of the closed landfill fund. The governor had recommended an open appropriation from the closed landfill fund. The House included an appropriation. It's a statutory appropriation. It does have uh, more restrictions on it that only the only the interest can be spent in any year, and it sunsets in four years after so we can see how it's being used, but I did track the same amount of revenue or spending as the governor did. Then, line, sorry, line 46 through 50, there are a number of governor's change items that showed up as change items, but they didn't necessarily have an expenditure with them. I did include them on here just to be able to track them. I believe these were all included in their line 46 was internal funding realignment. A number of uh, programs that are funded at the same level are just being switched between divisions to better operate. There's line 47 is environmental justice authority. I believe some language changed on this, Ms. Taylor can go through. Line 48 was tribal access to rural recycling grants. The house is including this language. Line 49, uniform labeling for compostable products. That is also included in this bill as a governor's recommendation. And line 50 was uh, enhanced efficiency by eliminating a duplicative report. The House does include that. On line 52, you'll see some of the revenues and transfers that are being accounted for at the Pollution Control Agency. So you see the Special Revenue Fund revenue related to the Landfill Responsibility Act. Line 54, that's the revenue from the air appropriation increase that's required under the Clean Air Act. Line 55, uh, the rulemaking requirement to set the fees for the air permits that they're able to later collect. So since we're appropriating money for the community liaison person, they'd be able to collect that revenue back through the air permitting fees as required in the bill, starting in the tails. And then getting on to the next page, you'll see the totals for the agency, for pollution control agency, non-general fund changes are 28 million for the biennium. A lot of that was the closed landfill fund and the Petro fund sunset date repeal. In total, all funding sources, statutory open and direct, all the funds is 536 million for the biennium. On line 73, you'll see the start of the Department of Natural Resources. Their base funding is 231 million. Uh, the general fund changes start on line 75. You'll see that $2 million that I referenced for legal costs. The governor had it at four, the house has it at two. Line 76 is accelerated tree planting to capture carbon. The governor had recommended 1.3 million per year. The DE2 is including that same amount. Line 77 is public safety response. 
there were the governor had recommended 3.327 in fiscal year 21 and then 2.227 in fiscal year 22 for this purpose. The DE2 includes $2,008,000 in fiscal year 21 and does not have a appropriation in fiscal year 22 for it. And then on line 78, you'll see an operating adjustment. This was also a governor's recommendation of a reduction in fiscal year 21 appropriations of $2,008,000. The house did include that, or the DE2 included that. Line 79, you'll see protect digital assets from cyber attack. The governor recommended $1.1 million per year. The DE2 includes $750 the first year and a million dollars each year thereafter. On line 81, or 80, you'll see addressing chronic wasting disease. The governor had included $1 million for this. The house included $750,000 from the general fund, of which $250,000 is for adopted dumpster program. Line 82, you'll see the farm survey day oversight transition is $250,000 to work on the program to transition the oversight from Florida Animal Health to DNR over the next biennium. Line 83, you'll see a one-time grant of $3 million to Red Lake Nation for AIS response. This was a governor's recommendation and is included in the DE2. Line 84, you'll see timber permit extensions. Uh, there's a $1,075,000 appropriation to cover the reimbursements, and this was the same as the bill that was heard in committee. Line 85 would be shade tree, shade tree grants to cities to address EAB and climate change. Uh, it starts at $750,000 the first year and then a million dollars each year thereafter. Line 86 is water use permit public meeting requirements. Um, that'd be $449,000 per year. And then line 87 is groundwater use sustainability research. This was the amount included in the fiscal note for these two pieces. Line 88, you'll see law enforcement salary increases. So it's $170,000 in fiscal year 21, $258,000 each year thereafter. And this is House File 401 that was heard in committee and passed out of committee. And then you'll see other fund appropriations for that in a minute. Line 89 is no child left inside grant program. The first two years, it has $150,000 per year. In the tails, it's $250,000 per year. In total, the general fund changes to DNR are 21.489 million for the first biennium and 16 million in the tails. Going down to line 94, you'll see the non-general fund change items. Um, the first one be advancing DNR forest inventory. This was a governor's recommendation of $1 million from the forest management investment account. The whole DE2 is including that same amount of same amount in the bill. On line 95 and 96, you'll see an increase to the state park vehicle permit fees. Um, the, the governor had recommended, I think, is a $10 change to most of the fees, but there are daily and different ones. The house DE del delayed that one year, so you'll see half the revenue and expenditure in the first year and then the full amount starting in the second year. And then the next line is the um, state park license plates that you can purchase. That one does not have a delayed one year delay in it. So you'll see the full amount of spending there. On line 97, you'll see an increase to the law con appropriation. This was a governor's recommendation to spend the increased amount of money that is coming in. In the bill, you'll see a change in the rider that has prioritization in, of certain projects if allowable under federal law. On line 98, 99, the governor had recommended allowing the agency to use a portion of the lottery in lieu for local <laughs> grants or administration of those grants. The house includes that amount and the language for that. On line 100, you'll see an increase to watercraft registration fees. The appropriations are the same, are the same in the bill. The house in, the included the same increases to each of them. There are the exemptions that were talked about in committee for non nonprofits and homestead resorts. Uh, so the revenue amounts are slightly different. On line 101 and 102, you'll see a non-game wildlife account. The governor had recommended making that account statutory instead of direct. The DE2 keeps it as direct, but does do a one-time appropriation of $500,000 from the balance of the fund, um, just to get the money out the door and kind of what the agency intended to spend it once they were able to do it as statutory. 
on line 103, 104, and 105, you'll see a change to the aquatic invasive species surcharge. There's also revenues associated with these. Um, the DE2 includes the $25 surcharge fee, of which $21 goes to the DNR, and then $2 of that must be used for aquatic plant management grants, and $4 must be go to the Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center for grants. So you'll see the new appropriations here, $2 million per year for the DNR, 500,000 more for the plant management grants, and 1 million for the U of M for research. On line 106, you'll see clarifying allowable uses of state park reservation fees. Uh, again, this was one of those change items that was the governor's recommendation, but um, doesn't have a expenditure necessarily associated with it. It is in the bill and included in the DE2. On line 107, you'll see the electric assisted bicycle modifications. This was the bill that was heard in committee. It stays the same, and the DE2 appropriates 20,000 the first year and 5,000 each year from the state after that for the um, from the state parks account for the purpose of that bill. Line 108, you'll see the state parks lottery in lieu increase. There's a $1.5 million one-time appropriation from the account, just from a balance in the account. On line 109, there's a grant for Voyager Country ATV trail system of $950,000. I believe that's the same as what you heard in the bill and committee. Line 110 is a grant for prospector loop trail from the ATV account of $955,000. I, can't, I believe that one is the same as it was heard in committee. Line 111 is a local trails grants lottery in lieu. There's a $300,000 increase in both of the fiscal year 22 and fiscal 23, but then the base goes back to what it was. And that's just from the balance in the lottery in lieu account. Line 112, you'll see the lottery, law enforcement salary increases. This would be the natural resources fund portion of it, 199,021 and then 303 each year thereafter. Line 113 and 114, the governor had recommended making the cross-country ski account statutory for the state trails or skiing trails. And the house includes that language. And this is just how that shows up on the spreadsheet. Then line 115 are the zoo grants lottery in lieu. Uh, there's 280,000 as pass through grants through DNR. They go to the Como Zoo and the Duluth Zoo. Then there's also 140,000 under the Minnesota Zoo you'll see later. And that was all the natural resources fund changes and they totaled 21 million. Line 118, you'll see the game of fish fund changes. The first one is requiring a permit for youth fishing tournaments. This was a governor's recommendation. Again, there's no appropriation associated with it, but it is included in the DE2. Then line 119 is clarifying authority for existing permits and licenses. This again was a governor's recommendation and no appropriation associated with it, but it is included in the DE2. Line 120 is the law enforcement salary increases again. This is the game and fish fund portion, 587 and 21, and then 889 each year thereafter. And then on line 121, you'll see adopt a dumpster program. This would be a one time $250,000 appropriation from the emergency deer feeding and wild survey health account. That was all the game and fish fund changes. On line 123, you'll see a small piece from the remediation fund, again, for the law enforcement salary increases. And then line 125 through 128, there's a number of changes related to the critical habitat license plate account. This would be represent, uh, the bill that was heard in committee, and I believe amended. So the revenues, instead of going fully to the RIM critical habitat account, are now split by kind of the type of license plate. Um, and these are some of the expenditures for that. So non-game wildlife activities see a large increase. Aquatic management areas would be new. They uh, new dedication out of the account. And then we also the D2 also increased the amount allowed from the rim critical habitat account for promotion from 13,000. Now it'll be 25,000. And then I'll on the revenue, you'll see some more related to the rim critical habitat pieces. Line 130, the governor had a recommendation for investing in state forest campgrounds that allowed the DNR to keep a portion of the revenues from state forest campgrounds on school trust lands. That is not included in this bill. On line 132, the governor had a recommendation for the Office of School Trust Lands for Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness Land Exchanges. That is included in this bill. It's $1 million in the first biennium and then 400,000 after that for land exchanges. 
and that's from the permanent school fund. Then line 134, you'll see the revenue increases. The line 135 and 36, or sorry, 135 would be the sales tax revenue for the, based on the state park permit increases. And then line 136 would be the lost sales tax revenue for the open access for tribal members on state park lands. Line 137 and 38 are the pieces for that state forest campground that are not included in this bill. The line 139 would be the increase to the state park vehicle fees. As I mentioned, they go up the first year or basically they go up $5 the first year and then $10 after that, the governor recommended a $10 increase. So it's lagging at half the amount the first year. And then this, the second one of the 137 is the revenue from the um, state park license plates that allow you into the state parks. Line 141 is the lost revenue to state parks account for open access for tribal members on state park lands. Uh, line 142 was the governor's recommendation for to authorize the use of state park Per, uh, vehicle permit fees that's included. Line 143 is the lands bill. It's revenue of 34,000. Line 144, the governor recommended rounding up the AIS surcharge from 1060 to $11. The DE2 includes the $25 surcharge that was heard in committee. And this is the amount that would go to each of the purposes. So you have the DNRs, AIS work, the amount for uh, aquatic plant management grants, and then the U of M research grants. Uh, line 147 is the increase to watercraft registration fees. Again, the numbers, the amounts for each fee are the same as the governor. However, there's an exemption that was talked about in committee that was added for nonprofits and homestead resorts. So the amount of revenue is slightly low, lower. Line 148 through 150 is the lost revenue related to the DUI uniformity bill. 151 is the turtle taking provisions, lost revenue. Line 152 is a critical habitat license plate um, money again, actually 152 through 56 are. So you'll see a reduction to the amount that goes to critical habitat, the increase to the non-game purposes, the increase to aquatic management purposes, and then you'll see the increase for pollinator activities and that transfers to the border water and soil resources. So in total at the Department of Natural Resources, the non-general fund changes are $34 million. You can see each type of fund, each fund that listed there. And the total for all funds to DNR, statutory open and direct are 958 million for the biennium. Line 171 is a transfer to the mining environmental regulatory account that stays at the base. Line 173 is the Board of Water and Soil Resources. On line 175, the Governor recommended climate mitigation and soil health via agricultural cover crops. That was 5.5 million per biennium. The whole House DE2 includes that at 1 million per biennium. Line 176 was climate, climate adaptation, water storage and treatment. The governor had recommended 3 million per biennium. Uh, the DE2 includes 1 million per biennium. Line 177, the DE2 added the Lawns to Legrooms program at $500,000 per year. And line 178 is the Board of Water and Soil Resources operating adjust adjustment that was the same as the governor's rec of 291,000 for the first biennium. In total, there's 3.291 million in changes to the Board of Water and Soil Resources. Non-general fund change items, you'll see the transfer in and the expenditure of the dedication of the pollinator plates to Lawns to Legumes program. Uh, so it'd be 324,000 for each biennium. The total appropriations and spending for water, border water and soil resources are 57,628,000. Line 194 is the Conservation Corps. They stay at the base level of funding. Line 204 is Metropolitan Council Parks. The general fund stays the same at the base, but there was an increase of 3 million for the biennium one-time money from the lottery in lieu account. In total, the Met Council Parks would receive 21.280 million. The Minnesota Zoo, you'll see on line 216, the governor recommended changes of 1.595 million in fiscal year 21, 
and then 9.9 .9 million for the 22-23 biennium and the, the tails of 916,000. The DE2 includes the same for those purposes. In line 222, you'll see the lottery in lieu increase for the Minnesota Zoo. In total, the Minnesota Zoo receives $57,305,000. Line 232 is a science museum. They, the DE2 included an operating adjustment of 1,939,000 one time to bring the total to 28,688,000. Explore minute, sorry, that was the base for that one. It was tough. The Science Museum receives 4,097,000. The base for tourism is 28,688,000. The DE2 included the operating adjustment the governor recommended of 269, the first biennium and 358, the second biennium and then added a one-time appropriation of $750,000 for community events grants and a cargo of that of $250,000 to um, the Grand Portage ban for tourism to Grand Portage for a total appropriation to explore Minnesota tourism of $30,824,000. The general fund base for the entire bill was $331,988,000. Uh, total with change items was $371,892,000. If you include the fiscal year 21 appropriations towards the target, you're, it comes to 373,000 or 373,349,000, which is 41,361,000 above base. And total appropriations is spending open statutory direct all funds is 1.668 million or 1.668 billion. And that is all I have for the walkthrough on that one. I can go very quickly through the next ones. Article two is what would be referred to as the 2020 Environment Natural Resources Trust Fund Bill. This would be uh, the fiscal year 21 appropriations. Nothing changed in this bill from the House File 32E that you heard previously. It appropriates 61,387,000. Article three would be the 2021 Environment Natural Resources Trust Fund Bill, which would be the fiscal year 22 appropriations. You previously heard House File 151 in committee. Everything is the same except if you go to line 109, you'll see there is a subdivision added that repurposed some other previous appropriations that would have expired uh, later this year. So there's $840,000 that's getting appropriated to forest health research development and demonstration at the U of M for the NR U of M NRRI. And this was a bill that you had heard, I believe, a week or two ago in committee, but the funding level is lower than that bill is. Requesting. And you can see the four appropriations that those are coming from. And that is all I have for the spreadsheet, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hagemeyer. Um, Ms. Taylor, if you want to go next. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to go through the DE2 uh, amendment, starting with Article 1. And I'm not going to go through all the riders because it's pretty evident where the money's getting spent from the spreadsheet. But I'm just going to point out a few things that aren't clear from the spreadsheet. And the first I'm going to point out would be on page 24, lines 15 through 19. This is the LACON rider that Mr. Hagenmeyer mentioned. And that's where you'll find the additional language requiring prioritization of projects for environmental justice areas and environmental justice. The next section or uh, next thing I wanted to point out would be on page 31, uh, subdivision 10 on lines 9 through 27. This is the um, ATV trail appropriation extensions from Representative Eklund's bill. And then the next thing I'd want to point out would be on page 34. It'd be lines uh, 16 through 23. This is language from uh, Representative Bo 1621, allowing the Lower Minnesota River Watershed District to use um, some of their funding for the Seminary Fen Stabilization Project. And then I'll go to page 38. Uh, section 11 is a new section stating that if uh, federal funds are available that for any of the appropriations, that those ap appropriations uh, cancel to the general fund. And then section 12 is a extension of a parks and trails um, fund uh, project for the Proctor Hermantown Munger Trail Spur. This, is, this language is also being carried in the legacy bill. Uh, section 13 is in uh, a provision that would extend the availability of the DNR's EAB grant from last 
background. And then if you go to page 41, there's section 14, is uh, some language that the DNR had requested, just a technical technical related to the cross-country cross ski account changes that were made. And then if you um, go ahead to page 47, you'll see an extension of a off-highway motorcycle master plan appropriation. And then on 47, that's the start of article two. And as Mr. Hagemeyer said, there are, were no changes from House File 30 as it was um, sitting on the general register. So I'm not gonna go through that article. So we'll skip ahead to article three. And again, this is the LCCMR bill as it was in House File 151. So I'm not gonna point out anything except for the new subdivision that uh, Mr. Hagermeyer mentioned. That would be, um, it would start on page 128, section 19, and then you'll see how the um, four appropriations were repurposed for the NRRI project. And so that would bring us to article four, which is the pollution control article. Uh, the first section is from Representative Lee's House File 644 um, with the community health boards. This language is the language as it was amended in the health committee. So there was a, there were some changes from what the committee did see. Uh, section two is from the governor's budget bill. If you go to page 134, that's where the actual word would be. And this, uh, on the bottom of the page there, it would require parties entering into negotiated agreements to um, kind of compensate the agency for the agency's costs. Uh, the next section three on page 136, this was added to the PCA policy bill, if you remember, um, requiring notification of discharges. This language was um, um, modified from what was originally amended. Uh, the next section four is from the governor's budget bill. It would add to the judicial remedies of the agency um, actions to cease performance. Section five is from House File 248, Representative or Chair Wazowicz's bill. This required public hearing before large settlements. And this is the language as it was laid over. Uh, section six through eight, these are all from the governor's budget bill. Section six would detail what injuncts, <coughs> excuse me, injunctive reliefs is and specify that they would include um, requiring a facility to stop operations. Um, section seven would prohibit extensions under stipulation agreements based solely on costs. Uh, section eight would allow the PCA to require a facility that didn't get a permit to comply with the applicable, applicable permit requirements. Uh, sections nine and 10 um, were originally proposed in the governor's budget on um, their new definitions for environmental justice and environmental justice area. These are different from what the governor proposed. Then you'll see some language later on from Representative Lee's bill and these, these definitions would mirror what he's proposing in that. Uh, sections 11 through 16, starting on the bottom of page 139, are sections from the PCA policy bill. These are the e-waste provisions and they're all the same as the committee saw them earlier. So we can skip ahead to page 147. Uh, section 17 through 22 are the Landfill, uh, Landfill Responsibility Act from the governor's budget bill. These are um, all as proposed, except there were some minor changes um, to accommodate the new environmental justice um, definitions. So we can skip ahead to page 153, uh, section 23 is another one from the governor's budget bill. This would allow tribes to um, be eligible for the competitive recycling grants. Uh, sections 24 through 27 are all from the PCA policy bill and they're all as they were heard um, before. So we can skip to those and to, uh, to page 157, section 28. This is the Closed Landfill Investment Fund um, that our, uh, Mr. Hagemeyer mentioned um, with the changes um, from what the, governor, what the governor proposed. You'll see that only the interest earned is appropriated, the reporting requirement, and then um, it actually would expire after four years if you look on uh, line 27 of the page. On the bottom of the page is a new definition of commissioner that was proposed in the governor's budget bill. And then uh, on page 158, section 30 is from Representative Lee's bill. This is the, um, the, the provision that would require some rulemaking to assess cumulative, 
impacts in environmental justice areas. This has changed from um, what the committee did see, and you'll see the new definitions that were also being mirrored in the um, for the overall chapter in 115A. And they'll, they're also used later on. I'll point those out. Uh, the next thing that we can look at would be section 31. Uh, this is another section from the PCA policy bill. No change here. Uh, sections 32 and 33 are from um, Representative uh, Lee's bill, House File 403, that would um, establish some public meeting requirements for non expiring permits. This is a modified um, version of that particular. Um, bill. And there's another section too that I'll point out later. Uh, section 34 is from the governor, governor's budget. It's one of the pieces that the governor originally proposed for addressing environmental justice. This is how the governor proposed it, but just the definition of environmental justice and environmental justice area have been changed. You'll see that on line 163.8 and 163.9. They're using those same definitions. Uh, sections 35 through 37 are similar to those um, other earlier sections from the PC, um, from the governor's budget um, requiring the agency to recover um, costs of negotiated agreements, the stipulation agreement requirements, um, not allowing them to be, extensions to be made based solely on costs and then require, allowing the agency to require those who didn't get a permit to comply with the applicable permit requirements. Uh, sections 38 and 39 are from the PCA policy bill, and those are as they were heard earlier, so we can skip ahead to section 40 on page 168. This is from House File 1165 on the compostable labeling requirements, and this is um, as the committee heard it, so there were no changes here. Uh, section 41 on page 170. This is from House File 79 um, with the ban on PFAS and food packaging. There were some changes to the language on the definitions um, for food package were modified as well as some additional language. If you look on page 171, lines four through six, um, paragraph B is new as well. Uh, section 42 um, is related to House File 503. This is the air permit community liaison position Mr. Higgemeyer mentioned. And then section 43 is the PFAS water quality standards and 44 is the health risk limits. Uh, these were um, as the committee heard them earlier. Section 45 on the bottom of page 171 is the replacement language for the carpet stewardship program. This would require the PCA to put together a plan in, um, in coordination with the new task force. Then the final section in that article is the repealer. Um, I'll just go through those real quick. Uh, the first one is from the governor's budget bill. This is a re reporting requirement um, repeal. The 15C reference is the Petro Fund repealing the sunset of that. And then the rule is from the PCA policy bill. And that was the hazard ranking system reference. And then I can move on to Article 5. Uh, the first section is from House File 733. This is modifying the reporting requirements of the Natural Resources as Asset Preservation and Replacement Account. This is as it was heard in committee or laid over. Uh, sections 2 through 15 are all from the 2020 DNR Policy Bill. There were no changes here, and we've all seen the, this language quite a bit, so we can just kind of skip ahead to page 181, um, there's section 16. This is the language from House File 718, um, dealing with the city pesticide ordinances. This language does reflect an amendment that was done in the A committee. I believe that um, it was just an, an additional exemption was added in subdivision four, in subdivision four on page 182. Section 17 is from House File 1489, um, the expedited rulemaking authority for the Mississippi River Corridor critical area rules. It says, as the committee heard it, uh, Section 18 and this is another section from the 2020 policy bill, no change there. Uh, sections 19 and 20 on page 185 are from House File 214, adding natural carbon sequestration to the Forest for the Future program, no changes here. 
uh, sections 21 through 23 are all from the 2020 policy bill, no changes here. Uh, sections 24 through 27 are from the critical habitat license plate bill that we heard previously. There were a few changes I'll point out. Um, the match requirement was increased a little bit for uh, non-game spending to two, two and a half for every $1. And you'll see that on line 186.19 and 186.20. And then there's a technical um, change on page 187, line 20. Uh, you'll see later on in the bill that the lawns to legumes program was statutorily created. So the reference to that is um, added here. Uh, the next section would be section 28. This is another section from the policy, one of the policy bills. This is 2021, no change here. Uh, section 29 is from House File 1210. This is the broadened language um, that would ban insecticide use on all state lands. Section 30 is from House File 76, the outdoor engagement grant account. This is as the committee um, heard it and laid it over. Section 31 is House File 2028. Um, more changes here, the invasive species management plan. Uh, section 32 is from the 2020 policy bill, no change there. Uh, section 33 is from House Bill 1896, the watercraft surcharge. There were some minor changes here just to accommodate the nonprofit and the homestead resort exemptions, but otherwise the language is the same. Section 34 is um, a new section that would expand the loose line trail to include a connection to Greenleaf Lake State Rec, Rec Area. Section 35 on page 191 is from the governor's budget bill. This uh, would allow the DNR to use some of the lottery and loo money to administer the local recreation grant program. Section 36 is um, combining uh, some changes in the policy bill as well as some govern, governor's budget changes on the on 191.29 and 191.30, you'll see the new language from the, the governor's budget bill. This would um, allow administrative penalties for failure to display a state park permit. Uh, section 37 is another 2020 policy bill section, no changes. Section 38 is from the governor's budget bill. This, is the provision that allows them to use their state park reservation fees for the point of sale system. Uh, sections 39 and 40 are um, 2020 policy bill um, sections, no changes there. Section 41 is from the 2020 policy bill along with the permits for um, tribe members. There is a change here. You'll see a new effective date on um, line 193.19. Section 42 is from the 2020 policy bill, no change there. Section 43 is from the governor's budget. Uh, this is the modified version of the state park permit fee increase. You'll see that this section with the full um, increase would take um, effect July 1st, 2022. And then later on in the bill, you'll see a temporary provision that would um, take place um, the next fiscal year only. Uh, the next section 20 is from the 2020 DNR policy bill. And then section 45 again is from the 2020 policy bill. And then sections 46 through 51, starting on page 195. These are all from the governor's budget bill with the watercraft license fees. These are, the amounts are all um, at the governor's level, except for the new exemptions for the nonprofits and the uh, Homestead Resort, similar to what was done in 2019. And you'll see that language um, in section 50, the subdivision four, four is amended on uh, page 196. Uh, the next section I'll talk about is section 52. This is the uh, watercraft surcharge increase to 25. And um, the only change from what the committee heard before is just the, some technical changes to accommodate the new exemptions for the nonprofit. And, resort watercraft license. Uh, section 53 and through 58 actually are more sections from House File 214 that added the carbon sequestration and climate change to the forestry statutes. These are all as they were um, heard in committee and laid over. 
Section 59 on the bottom of page 199 is from the DNR uh, governor's budget. Or no, this is from the DNR's policy bill. And these are all as um, laid over. So section 59, 60, and 61 are all from the policy bill. No changes there. Section 62 is from the turtle taking provisions, uh, House file 387. No changes to this section. And then the next two sections are from the 2020 policy bill. And you know, section 64 was also in House file 727 as well. Section 65 um, was in the 2021 policy bill, but you'll remember that there were some modifications um, that would also have removed the ability to use, uh, wear blaze pink. Those modifications were removed except for now the new ground, ground line requirements that the DNR had originally pr proposed would only allow blaze orange, not um, blaze pink. Section 66 on page 202, um, this was added to the policy bill, the non toxic shot requirements, and this is as it was laid over or included in that bill. Uh, section 67 is from the DNR policy bill, the 2021, that's as it was. Uh, section 68 is from the 2020 policy bill, and that's as it was. Section 69 is from the governor's budget. This is the fishing contest permit refund changes. Uh, if you go to page 204, uh, line 20, this um, would add a $50 fee for youth fishing contests. And then in section 70 on the bottom of that page, you see the exemption is removed. And then um, they're also changing the exemption for uh, rough fish contests and applying that only to hook and line. Uh, section 71 on the top of uh, page 205 is a section from the 2020 policy bill as a 70, uh, section 72. No changes there. Uh, sections 73 through 76 are all from the turtle bill. Uh, there were some changes in section uh, section 75. Some of the proposed um, prohibitions on um, harvesting methods were removed. Uh, the next section uh, I'll talk about would be section 71 or 77. And 78, actually, these are both from the 2020 policy bill and no changes there. Uh, section 79 is from the DNR's um, proposal on water use permits. Uh, that's House File 1491. Uh, one of three sections that is in that bill. This is the first one. Section 80 is from uh, Chair Hansen's um, water use bill, House File 1294. This is the one requiring public meeting meetings for large appropriators. Section 81 is in both of those bills. And then section 82 is from the DNR's bill. This is their proposal to restrict issuing permits for large um, appropriations if they're gonna be you know, used more than 50 miles from the point of the appropriation. Uh, section 83 is from House File 1294. That's, this is the um, sustainability standard. Uh, you'll notice that the vintage water requirements have been removed and were not included in the DE2. Uh, sections 84 and 85 are from the 2020 policy bill, no changes there. Section 86 is from the governor's budget bill. This is the um, state park plate minimum contribution and it would go up in full um, effective July 1. Uh, section 87 is from House File 214. This is the SFIA, um, adding natural carbon sequestration. Reference to that. Section 88 is from Eklund's 1260, the permit, timber permit relief bill. There were no changes here. Section 89 is another turtle provision, no changes here. Uh, section 90, I believe, was um, in a few bills. This is slightly modified. It's um, requiring DNR to come up with some carbon sequestration goals for the forest. And I know the reporting requirement was changed or the date in, date was, and I think there were some other modifications as well. Section 91 is the temporary increase for state park permits to phase that in that I mentioned previously. And then the final section in that article is the repealer. Uh, the first three are from the 2020 policy bill related to the Fort Ridgely State Park Golf Course. Uh, and then the rest of them are all from the turtle bill. And those are all as um, the committee heard them before. Uh, the next article six would be the water and soil resources. 
uh, section one is from House File 171, uh, changing how Bowser can use the easement stewardship accounts. Uh, there were no changes from what was laid over here. Section two, excuse me, two on page 217 is the new section establishing the Lawns to Legumes program and statute. Section three is from um, Chair Hansen's House File 1733, establishing the SWCDC at the county level. Uh, this language does reflect some amendments that were made in the tax committee, and, which included making the fee mandatory and then getting rid of the Clean Water Fund um, eligibility piece. Uh, section four is from House File 990, um, increasing the SWCD supervisor compensation max. Section five is from House File 932, establishing the water quality and storage program. Uh, this is as it was heard in committee. Section six, the soil health cost share program from House File 936. There were a few changes to this. Um, there's a new definition of soil health practices. If you look on line 2020.17, and then um, there's some technical changes to move the report into an uncodified section since it was one time, and that's on the bottom of page 221. And that takes us to Article 7, um, Farm Survey Day. Uh, all these sections were from House File 1727, Representative Griffin's bill. These are all as the committee saw them, except for some effective dates. And then there was um, some changes to Section 7 on page 225 that I'd go through. Um, you'll see that the effective date has been pushed out to 2023. And there's a new paragraph B that um, would keep the Board of Animal Health employees at the Board of Animal Health and require the DNR to contract with them. Article eight is um, from House File 695, the DUI uniformity. Uh, these are all as the committee saw them earlier. So we can jump ahead to Article nine on page 231. And this is uh, the electric assisted bicycles. This is all, um, the language is all from House File 32, and it's as the committee heard it. So there were no changes here. Walk, Boomer. Boomer. And then we can skip ahead to the last article, the state lands bill. And this is just a combination of the two lands bills, House File 133 and 1250. I'm just going to point out the differences from those two bills. So the first one would be on page 241. Um, section nine is actually from the DNR policy bill was just moved in here. So just to clear up any questions on where that came from. Uh, section 10 on page 242 is a new section requested by the DNR. It would allow them to consider uh, gifts of land when they're evaluating land exchanges um, for the benefit of the school trust. And then the next thing I'd want to point out would be on page 264, and this is the last section I'm going to point out, it'd be section 16. It, this is a new section that would allow the private sale of tax forfeited land in Beltrami County. And that's basically um, what I wanted to point out. If there are questions, I can answer them. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Um, Chair Hanson, did you have anything, any comments, anything you want to add before we move to member questions? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Janelle and Brad, for that thorough walk through it. It took about an hour. Um, and for those Minnesotans that are watching at home, uh, uh, we didn't wish to do a large bill. Um, there are a number of articles in here that are sitting on the House floor that could be run separately. Those are the, the two LCCMR bills, the uh, lands bill, and there are a couple of other provisions that could be adopted on their own, uh, but that's not what we've been able to achieve with the Senate. Uh, we have to we have to uh, deal with the cards that are dealt us, and uh, that's where we're at. We are in the middle of a pandemic, members. Uh, we are in the middle of unprecedented times, and that unprecedented times calls for leadership. And leadership means doing things that aren't always fun, that aren't, aren't always easy. Uh, but we have a number of problems that have been festering for a long time. How do we actually fund soil and water conservation districts uh, so that they can get the work done? How do we deal with emerald ash borer? 
it's been almost a dozen years since we had the first infestation. Chronic waste and disease continues to spread as do zebra mussels and other aquatic invasive species. This bill deals with EAB, CWD, and AIS, uh, and it makes changes in reforms trying to resolve them, but also investing in solutions to, to solve them. We continue our work on our pollinator journey to try to make things better, uh, to try to improve uh, the environment for the littlest things of which we are part of the web uh, that they are part of. We're all in this together. So I'm asking you for your support. We do have the agencies here available for questions. Uh, it is not their day for formal testimony, uh, but we will take testimony later, but they are available from all of the agencies uh, for taking those questions. All right, um, any member questions at this point? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, you know, I just want to acknowledge the bill author's comments and uh, the size of the bill. Uh, for those at home, as uh, Representative Hansen mentioned, um, you know, there is also a lot of changes here that uh, certainly don't need to be in this bill. Some very controversial changes um, at a time when we have very significant surpluses. We're continuing to raise fees on almost everything. And in most cases, I think we all can agree on the causes. And uh, we agree that it makes great sense to fund SWCDs or add more money to a number of different categories. Um, but is now the time to do that when we have such massive surpluses? Um, you know, those are big question marks. We also see a huge um, change in um, agency authority and continuing to add more and more government and bureaucracy in this bill at numerous policy and finance levels. And so I just have to mention that uh, this bill doesn't need to be this big. There's gonna be a lot of discussion in the coming weeks. And of course, as this bill comes to the floor as to uh, what needs to be in this bill and what doesn't, uh, there certainly is a difference of opinion and there'll be more like I said, conversation about that in the coming weeks. Representative Blewett. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I guess this is a question really for uh, uh, either Commissioner Strawman if she's available or a uh, senior member from the DNR. I see there's a, uh, a change in there that uh, speaks to transferring the responsibility for survey farm management from the Board of Animal Health to the DNR. Now, uh, there's a change we've not heard that talks about contracting. I would like to know right from the senior member present from the DNR uh, exactly uh, how you plan to contract and what exactly does the DNR foresee as the major things they're gonna immediately change. Uh, otherwise, why are we doing this? Uh, I see Commissioner Myers here. Commissioner Myers, do you want to take that one? Madam Chair, members for the record, Bob Myers, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. Representative Lewick, we will work with the legislature to make sure that that transition occurs as it needs to within statute. I think the language in the bill refers to that we would not need to hire another veterinarian. We would contract with the Board of Animal Health for their veterinarian services. But inspections and um, enforcement are a key to preventing the spread of CWD, making sure that the farms are in compliance and making sure that their, their fences are up to snuff. So um, we will do whatever we can to help combat that disease if the legislature transfers that authority to us. Representative Lewick, did you have a follow-up question? No, I think uh, there probably needs to be a lot more discussion, a lot more detail uh, as to making such a substantial move. Uh, you guys aren't even in the same building. Uh, and uh, so uh, this looks like a, uh, a train wreck uh, on the rails. But anyway, uh, we'll have to discuss this in a lot greater detail. Thank you. Representative Becker-Finn. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I uh, first, I want to thank uh, Chair Hansen for you know there really are some innovative things and some different ways of doing things in this bill. And I just um, I don't I don't think this bill is a train wreck. I think it's a really good bill, and uh, I look forward to further further discussion. I think um, as as was noted, you know we can't um, just sort of sit back and do nothing uh, when we you know we're sitting waiting on on the Senate to move some of these provisions and I, I know the chair had noted that as well that um, the bill would be smaller um, if we could move those things as standalone bills and um, as members know I've, I've authored several of those bills and have been pushing to get them done they're important things that we need to get done and so I think um, this is a good bill there's a lot of good things in it and I appreciate the transparency and um, you know, including all the including things that we have fully discussed in this committee. Um, obviously, any bill that's sort of moving us towards the future is maybe not going to be something that um, everybody is going to be comfortable with. Change is hard, but um, I think it's necessary, and I'm glad that we're moving in that direction um, with a lot of things in this bill. So, I uh, thank you for putting together a good bill. Representative Becker. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would agree with Representative Luke. Louis, this is a chain wreck, and I also would agree that it does a lot of things. It does a lot of bad. Uh, that's what this bill does. It hurts uh, my constituents in the my neck of the week. Um, I remember four years ago, um, our current chair would I'm um, talking about our bill done at the dark of the night. Um, a lot of this bill was put at the dark of the night without feedback. Um, so it does a lot of bad for the state of Minnesota. What it does is it pushes the risk takers, the people who are already doing good outside of the state, um, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, um, Iowa, Wisconsin will just say, hey, come over here because it penalizes people. So yeah, it does a lot of not so good. And so um, I'm, I'm such a big bill. It is really a... Um, um, I'm really sad that we're putting something like this together. So thank you, Madam Chair, for your time and committee members. Uh, Representative Lippert and then Representative Eklund. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I also just want to thank um, Chair Hansen for the work on this bill, um, especially the provisions related to emerald ash borer and planting trees. Uh, this is critically important for our state. I was recently hiking <laughs> with my spouse at Fort Snelling State Park. And just to see the damage that Emerald Ash Borer is doing just in that one small area of the Metro, thinking about the damage it's doing in so many places is really mind boggling. So we, we need to respond. This bill is a start. Um, so I appreciate that support. And then planting trees is one key thing we can do to respond to climate change. Our forests need to be a partner um, we just received news today that we had the highest parts per million uh, that we've, we've quote unquote achieved um, as a planet. So we have to be addressing climate change now and this bill is doing that. So um, uh, many thanks to the chair and committee members for the hard work here. Representative Eklund. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I just want to thank Representative Hansen for this bill. It's a lot of hard work putting together to build a bill like this, and I especially in, want to uh, express hope going forward that we will start taking this CWD crisis that we have in the state of Minnesota seriously. Remind members there's 8,307 survey captive survey in the state of Minnesota, and they are having a direct effect on what is going on in the state with our, with our wild whitetail herd and we need to do everything we can to get our hands around this crisis. And I will use it as a crisis until we uh, can get it cleaned up. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for the bill and thank you for including CWD in there. Representative Fisher. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would also like to uh, thank Chair Hansen for bringing the bill forward that we have today. It uh, addresses a number of things, uh, most importantly, some of the things that are addressing is things that will uh, that will protect the public, and things like addressing the issues that we heard around water gremlin. We heard about the process that happened out there where a company was able to uh, contaminate the environment for a number of years, 
And uh, as we got close to settlements, the community was not involved. So it's allowing the communities that are impacted to finally have a say into what's going on. And this is why we're set up, is we're set up to make sure that we're protecting the individuals that are out there. And this is an important part of what the MPCA should be doing. It's an important part of what we should be funding. Uh, for too many years, we had not been doing that part of the job and have been neglected over too many administrations. And it's time that we start standing up putting money where it is to the agencies to allow them to engage the public, make sure that we're protecting the public going forward. Same with water storage. I appreciate the work that is being done to advance pulling water back on the land, uh, which will help with erosion problems out there. Uh, dealing with the water permitting issue, make sure that we can solve some of the issues, make sure that our water is handled in a sustainable way for futures to come and not being shipped off to other parts of the country. So I wanna say thank you, Chair Hansen, for your bill. All right, I have, um, we'll go to Representative Lee first since he hasn't um, asked a question and we'll go back to Representative Heinzman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Chair Hansen, for bringing this bill forward. I'm really excited about the provisions that we have in the bill, specifically around environmental justice. Uh, to Representative Fisher's point, I know that you know, your community, uh, community uh, Representative Wozlawick and uh, Chair Becker Finn has been impacted by uh, you know, pollution and by bad actors, you know, water gremlin in my district and uh, Representative Jordan's district, Northern Meadows. Uh, we have provision in there that I'm going forward that any community that's been impacted by any serious violation, uh, you know, that they actually get the money back so that they can actually work to address some of the harms that have, done, have been done to their communities. And also uh, included in the bill is the cumulative impact uh, that are, we are requiring for future permits in the environmental justice area. I think this is a good start for us as we move forward. Uh, we need to bring, um, the, the voices of the communities that has been impacted uh, to the table so that they have a day to really, you know, address the concerns that they have. It's not that they, uh, you know, don't want uh, any of these industries that are coming in. They they very much want these economic opportunities to to happen in their communities, but, you know, not to the de detriment of their uh, health and to, you know, our environment that we cherish so much. So I really appreciate, uh, Mr. Chair, you including the provisions around cumulative mm -hmm. impact in the bill. And I really look forward to uh, working with you and uh, all the members of the committee to advance this forward. Thank you. Uh, Representative Heinzman, and then we'll go to Representative Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just looking at the agenda and I see hands are popping up now, but when I raised my hand, I was gonna suggest seeing we have uh, a little over 15 minutes left in today's hearing, it might be nice. Um, I know that the agencies aren't here to provide their formal responses, but it would be helpful to get kind of a at first glance uh, comment from them if possible before adjourning. But uh, of course that's in the uh, bill author's purview in the chair. So just a suggestion. Uh, Representative Jordan. Um, I saw Chair Hansen uh, nodding his head. Um, would, you, would you like to go to agencies or would you like me to? Um... If, Madam Chair, if Representative Jordan could maybe get her question and then we'll go to the agencies, but I, I do have want to comment before we go to the agencies, if we could do with Representative Jordan first. Thank you, Chair Hansen. Thank you, Chair Wasilek. Um, it's always good to be part of a team. I really want to echo a lot of what's already been said, especially by Representative Lee. This is a bill that really takes into consideration the people that passed environmental bills have left behind, specifically people who are, you know, feeling the brunt of climate change, they're feeling the brunt of industry, they're feeling the brunt of chemicals. So there's a lot of really thoughtful um, ways that we are balancing the needs of our of our environment and the people who rely on that environment. So I think it's really great that we're looking at PFAS and how that's in our water, but also in our food. Um, and takeout containers. So thank you for including that provision. Thank you for including the provisions around cumulative impacts. Um, that's something that we need to be doing going forward and making really part of our lexicon about how we're determining where industry should go, but also echo Representative Whipper, making sure that we're addressing climate change through um, reforestation and all the other impacts there are really important. We know that urban and uh, poor communities and communities of color feel the brunt of climate change as well. So. Thank you for making a really resilient um, and responsive bill for, for everyone's constituents. Um, and 
Chair Hanson, if I can just throw in a couple of comments here before I turn it over to you. Um, I also want to thank the chair for putting together what I think is a good bill. Um, there are a lot of provisions in here. Uh, I think all of us on this committee were rather surprised and shocked by um, what came about from the OLA report on Water Gremlin. And I know that you know members from both sides have, have brought it up in, in future committee meetings um, after the report was released and we discussed it. So I think um, there are a number of provisions in the bill that, that work to address that situation. Um, some of the, the stuff about um, stipulation agreements and public meetings and um, giving money to health boards and non-expiring permits. There's a whole lot of things in there that um, were directly related or indirectly related to what happened at Water Gremlin um, and what impacted my community and the communities of other folks on this committee. And so I wanna, wanna thank Chair Hansen for, for addressing those issues. And also um, PFAS, I think, um, you know, we have all these, all these acronyms that were thrown around here, AIS and CWD and EAB and PFAS is another one that um, we know is everywhere and is going to, um, as we've seen in the last several weeks, is, is going to become a bigger and bigger problem. And it's really important that we address those issues now um, as opposed to waiting until later, because we know the issue will not only be bigger because we'll know more about where, where the chemicals are, but we, we know that it costs more on the back end um, to have the state having to clean up those chemicals as opposed to addressing at the front end. So happy to see some of those um, pieces as well. And I do see Representative Morrison, um, if, if we can take a comment from her and then we'll put the chair over you, Chair Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just have a brief comment. I wanna thank uh, Chair Hansen for all of his work on this bill. And I think it's worth noting that this bill does a wonderful job of centering the people and the land and the water and the wildlife of Minnesota, which after all is what our committee is tasked with uh, protecting. So I, I just wanted to, to make that comment and, and thank the chair again for his tremendous leadership of this committee. Thank you. And Chair Hanson, I'll turn it over to you for uh, some comments here and then we'll maybe get some feedback from agencies if you wanna do that today. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I wanted to, since everybody is thanking me, I want to make sure I thank the committee. This is really a committee effort. Um, and, and Representative Heinzman, uh, Representative Lewick, Representative Backer, uh, I appreciate your opposition. I think it's important uh, for the minority to help polish these bills. And, I, and although you may not uh, realize it, uh, it has helped uh, as we have framed uh, and as we have uh, changed items to try, we have taken input uh, from the dialogue and the debate. Our very first committee meeting, we heard the LCCMR, the 2020 LCCMR bill. And I believe it was the second committee, we heard the 2021. So those bills have been there now for uh, almost three months waiting. And I'm hopeful that we could maybe with your help, we could uh, break those loose out of this large bill and take them one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one if we could do that. I think it would be better for Minnesotans. Uh, uh, they're ready, they're ready to go. They've been fully vetted uh, and hopefully that uh, we could achieve an accomplishment there. I do wanna uh, just with the agencies uh, speak to three different agencies because they often haven't been um, cut, uh, brought into the full uh, committee hearing. And uh, one of those is John Edmond with Explore Minnesota Tourism. I'd like to give him a few moments I wanna have the Science Museum and acknowledge the work that Representative Keeler has done in drafting a letter to the governor uh, seeking if we could make up those operating losses that would help, help us in overall budgeting. And then uh, also the Minnesota Zoo where we're asking for some federal assistance as well. Those things, uh, if, if the three smaller agencies, uh, uh, small things are important. And so if those three agencies could talk Representative Heinzman, if that's with the short time left, I'd like to give them the opportunity because they're often overlooked. All right, Mr. Edmund, if you can identify yourself for the record. Sure, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. My name is John Edmund. I am the director of Explore Minnesota uh, Tourism. Uh, Representative Hanson, appreciate the opportunity to very briefly address you. I appreciate all the support that this committee has provided to the leisure and hospitality industry. It's probably no surprise to all of you that the leisure and hospitality industry was one of the hardest hit industries as a result of the pandemic. Our industry has uh, lost almost half its value, almost $8 billion since the start of the pandemic. We need every dollar we can to compete. Travelers are starting to show a, a, a much more interest in, in travel, particularly in, in the outdoors. We not only appreciate the support for the, the general operating budget, 
but I think the provision in there for funding for events is critically important as well because that will help that hard hit aspect of the industry uh, onto the road of recovery. So thank you very much, Madam Chair and, and Representative Jansen. Thank you, Mr. Edmund. Um, I believe we have Mr. Severson here from the Science Museum. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, we are very appreciative to be included in the bill, uh, recognizing Representative Keeler's introduction of uh, one-time support for the museum. Uh, as President Brown has shared in um, two different uh, times before the committee, we have uh, been very significantly impacted by the effects of the pandemic. Uh, we've had roughly $35 million in revenue interruption. Uh, we anticipate $20 million in uh, operational losses from March 2020 to March 2022. Uh, we are very grateful to be included uh, with our general appropriation to help with those operations and with Representative Keeler's uh, one-time appropriation to help, help right the ship. Um, as we know, the cultural institutions and the work that we do throughout the state uh, are important and we are very grateful to um, this money would be very helpful to to help us relaunch as we um, disengage from the pandemic and make sure that we're bringing important staff back to help fulfill our mission. So thank you. Um, and then we have a few people from the zoo. I'm not sure if Mr. Frawley wants to speak to this or someone else, but whoever whoever wants to speak up, if you can identify yourself for the record. Yes, Madam Chair, it's John Frawley, director of the Minnesota Zoo. Uh, so thanks for the time. And uh, I also want to thank uh, um, Chair Hansen for, and others for including the Minnesota Zoo in, in the, um, this bill. As you know, some organizations weathered the pandemic better than others. Uh, the Minnesota Zoo, unfortunately, as Mr. Edmund you know, pointed out with our industry, um, did not weather the pandemic very well to, to date. Uh, in our 42-year history, I think the zoo, the state investment that we've made here, is in one of the worst positions it's ever been in, with over 125 positions laid off or affected, um, dispositioning of animals. Um, it's my job just to be transparent and let you know that's that's this case that's happened at the Minnesota Zoo, and we've still been operating under those um, reduced capacities uh, ever since those layoffs. So uh, this, uh, we do have a thoughtful plan. Our rec uh, request is very thoughtful and I think appropriate and so we are um, appreciate being included. Um, I think right now I think we all agree that uh, having a, a a place like the Minnesota Zoo within the state of Minnesota it's going to be a really important for the recovery of Minnesotans. Not everybody's going to be able to or want to travel out of the state and to have a destination like the zoo within our state that's affordable I think it's going to be a big part of the recovery here in Minnesota. So um, we appreciate all the work and um, and you know, being included, and um, we have a thoughtful plan of recovery. So thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Chair Hansen, any final comments or announcements? If we could, uh, if we could have Lisa Barras uh, with Met Council maybe speak as well, since we've got a couple minutes. Sure, Ms. Barajas. Thank you, Madam Chair, I'm Representative Hansen. We, we, uh, I'm Lisa Barajas, the Community Development Director with the Metropolitan Council for the record. Um, we also really appreciate um, being included in this bill, especially on the operations and maintenance funding um, will be absolutely critical in helping to address uh, the increased wear and tear in our regional parks and trail system that we experienced over the last year due to, uh, I guess, what you might call a silver lining of the pandemic, really introducing a number of new folks to the outdoors as they were recreating over the last year during COVID. Um, this is really a great opportunity um, to continue to have folks uh, coming back to our parks and trails, but we do have that increased uh, operations and maintenance and really just want to thank um, everyone on the committee on behalf of the regional parks implementing agencies for that funding and inclusion in this bill. Thank you. Chair Hanson, anything else, anyone else you want to hear from today? Well, I was debating whether we could squeeze Mr. Jashke in, in a minute and then uh, have Mr. Strohmeyer walk us through the west, rest of the week. Uh, Mr. Jashke? Mr. Jasky? Yep, I mean, okay. Well, yeah, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and members. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, 
I won't go into all the details, of course, because you don't have much time for that. But uh, I wanted to thank the chair and members for putting forth the uh, policy items related to the climate recommendations coming from the governor's uh, sub cabinet. Uh, those are very, very helpful. Hopefully, we can find a little more uh, funding to get those going because, of course, acceleration uh, in our climate work is what we really need to do. And, and we'd like to see uh, you know, some of those amounts get closer to the governor's recommendations for sure. We appreciate the effort on the soil and water conservation district funding. It's, you know, a partial solution. You know, of course, we've got uh, some counties that won't be able to generate much of a meaningful amount with those additional fees through that process, but we appreciate the effort to create a, a starting point. Um, and also, uh, you know, thank you again for the work that you've put into the operating fund adjustment and the easements account and some of the other pieces that are in there that are really helpful. And finally, uh, the pollinator uh, policy, I think, is also a good addition. And that's very, very important work and uh, finding a way to make it uh, sustainable for the long haul, I think, is a really good recommendation. So thank you for your time. All right. I think we'll have uh, Mr. Strohmeyer walk us through the schedule for the rest of the week. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the So Thursday, we'll be meeting from 1 to 530. Uh, we have an extra long uh, committee meeting on Thursday. Uh, the deadline to submit amendments uh, to the DE2 amendment uh, is electronically to me uh, by uh, 1 p.m. Wednesday, or well, I guess tomorrow, April 7th. Um, we'll post those shortly after. Um, on Thursday, April 8th, or the committee will take public testimony first, uh, mark up the bill, and then vote. Um, the details on how to sign up to testify are on the website, but uh, we're having a deadline to sign up in person or remotely, um, verbally uh, by 6 p.m. Uh, tomorrow. And then uh, written testimony on the DE2 would be accepted if it's submitted by 1 o'clock tomorrow, and then written testimony to uh, any potential amendments. Uh, will be due by six uh, tomorrow as well. Uh, we will move the DE2 amendment. Um, we'll move the bill, move the DE2 amendment on Thursday, uh, takes amendments to that and then adopt the amendment and then adopt the bill. So amendments to the DE2 will be in order. So if any other members have questions on the process, feel free to reach out and I'll answer them the best I can. Thank you. Madam Chair. I anticipate there will be some technical amendments, probably in an author's amendment. There may be some additional amendments uh, coming from the majority, um, but uh, those will be posted. And then, uh, Mr. Strohmeyer, we have a meeting next week as well that people should mark their calendar for. Yes, um, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair, we'll meet on uh, Monday, April 12th, I believe. Uh, to hear House File 600 um, bill from Representative Wickler on cannabis. And the details are on testimony and the setup is also posted on that hearing notice as well. And Madam Chair. Representative Hansen. And I do want to note and thank uh, uh, Becca Nash with LCCMR, the staff from the DNR and the staff from the PCA are here, who are here. I did not forget you, uh, but I wanted to make sure that we uh, started with the small and moved up, and uh, I'm assuming you'll be here uh, uh, later in the week. So um, let's uh, let's get this done. All right, nothing else before the committee today. We are adjourned. <laughs>